Andrea Woody. I am chair of the philosophy department here at the University of Washington. <laughs> and I'd like to welcome everyone to the second O'Hara lecture in the philosophy of physics. Let me begin by thanking a few people whose support uh, and efforts are crucial in making this event happen. The first person is Kate Golden. Kate, are you? Huh? <laughs> Kate is our all of uh, the logistics of making tonight happen. So thank you so much, Kate. And then second, Ben Feinzeit. And Ben is an assistant professor. You're going to hear a little more from him in just a minute. He's an assistant professor in our department who works in philosophy of physics. And he's helped coordinate uh, tonight's event. And in general, will be helping us uh, develop the philosophy of physics lecture series as we go forward. So thank you, Ben. And then finally, and most importantly, I want to thank Patrick O'Hara and Katarina Randolph, um, whose financial support uh, makes this event possible, but even more than that, their support for intellectual curiosity and the development of public appreciation of uh, science generally uh, is the driving force behind this series. And so, Patrick, please know how much we appreciate the support. Uh, we share with you the belief that these sorts of events are incredibly important. So thank you so much. So the philosophy department here at the University of Washington seeks to engage with a broad range of contemporary issues of social, cultural, and political importance. We look for meaningful and innovative ways to apply traditional philosophical skills, most centrally those connected with analyzing reasoning and clarifying concepts. And we do so in order to grapple with fundamental questions that rest at the core of our lives, both as individuals and as members of society, who can influence, hopefully, and who will necessarily be influenced by the institutions that surround us. Now this sort of engagement requires us to reach out and make connections. We have faculty who work with the UW Center for Sensory Motor Neural Engineering, the Medical School, the Evans School for Public Policy, College on the Environment, the departments, and various departments including Classics, Germanics, History, Dance, Political Science, and Jewish Studies, just to name a few. We also reach outside the walls of our campus to facilitate conversations about politics in pubs and to encourage elementary school children to ask questions in conversation with their peers in order to find their voices at an early age. The O'Hara Lecture Series in Philosophy of Physics fits this mold perfectly. In conversation, Patrick O'Hara will elegantly express his desire to create forums for broad engagement with, remark with the remarkable achievements of contemporary science. In particular, he is eager to facilitate opportunities to grapple with the implications of fundamental physical theory to better understand the world we inhabit and our place in it. I thank Patrick and Katerina for making these lectures possible and creating an opportunity for us to interact with our scientific colleagues here on campus and with people throughout Seattle interested in deeper understanding of contemporary science. We're excited to welcome Professor Chris Smink from Western University as the speaker for tonight's lecture. The general structure of the evening will be as follows. Professor Smink will present his lecture in the first hour. That will be followed by approximately 30 minutes of question uh, and conversation. Afterwards, we invite all of you to a reception in the Walker Ames Room, which is just across the hall, uh, which will run from 8.30 to 9.30. Now to help me introduce our speaker for tonight, I'll turn the podium over to my colleague, Ben Feinzeit, an assistant professor in our department, who is, a who is our resident philosopher of physics, and whose research focuses in particular on the implications of algebraic formulations of quantum field theories. So Ben, I'll ask you to help us out now.
first thing that we should do is also thank Andrea, who's been uh, helping us to organize this event as well. So let's give her a round. So it's my pleasure to introduce for you Chris Smink, our speaker for tonight's O'Hara Lecture in Philosophy of Physics. Now Chris is an exemplar of a very special kind of philosopher of physics and a philosopher of science who engages actively <coughs> with contemporary science and working scientists. Now, for a long time, philosophers of physics didn't do this, or at least didn't do it enough. Many philosophers have only cared to learn very little bit about physics, the little bit that would help them engage with one or two issues in philosophy of physics, in particular the measurement problem in quantum mechanics or some other very special issues in relativity theory. And these philosophers, at least to contemporary readers, <coughs> didn't seem to care what working scientists were doing at the time or how their philosophical work might bear on contemporary science at all. And Chris Smink's work, I think, is exactly the opposite of this. And it's for this reason that we're particularly excited to hear what he has to say this evening. Chris has been a pioneer in the area of philosophy of cosmology. He's focused attention on the issues that contemporary cosmologists grapple with. And he's also focused attention on what philosophers can contribute to ongoing progress in the scientific enterprise, in particular in scientific cosmology. His work has opened up a new field in philosophy of science, and I think it exemplifies a particularly fruitful approach to philosophy of science and philosophy of physics. Okay, now I need to tell you some of his credentials. So Chris Smink is an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy at Western University in Ontario, Canada. He's director of the Rotman Institute for Philosophy there. He's also currently one of the lead investigators on the collaborative project called Laws, Methods, and Minds in Cosmology, which is supported by the John Templeton Foundation. He's worked on many different topics in the philosophy and foundations of physics, from particle physics to the history and mathematical foundations of general relativity, and even Newton's physics and metaphysics. His publications include some major edited collections, including The Genesis of General Relativity and The Oxford Handbook of Newton. His main research area, though, is the topic that he'll be talking about tonight, that is scientific methodology in cosmology. So please help me welcome Chris Smink as he attempts to answer for us the question, how is scientific cosmology possible? Thank you very much to everyone involved in, in bringing me here. It's uh, great to see you all coming here to, to hear this talk. And thank you to Patrick for supporting work that really is important. One of the things that, with my hat on as director of the Rotman Institute of Philosophy, that we also support is engaging with broader audiences. And we also believe that philosophy really thrives when we're reaching out to people in other disciplines and also to the public. Uh, more generally. So it's important that we see this as part of our mission as philosophers to ensure that we're speaking to broader audiences. So thank you for letting me do that here tonight. So um, one theme throughout the development of philosophy has been understanding how we can uh, make knowledge claims about the natural world, how we can have justified claims, and what the source of uh, our evidence is and how we can use that evidence to make uh, substantive claims about the, the natural world. And one thing that philosophers have often pondered is whether there are limits to the kind of knowledge that we can achieve and whether there are some subject-specific limits on the kind of knowledge or the way that we should go about achieving that, uh, that knowledge. And my title has been to evoke the question of whether there are such limits in the case of cosmology. Um, I was struck when I was looking uh, at the dictionary, uh, I think it was a new Webster's dictionary that I had on my shelf, that uh, just in the very definition of cosmology, there's a nice little contrast. That there's two senses given. The first is a branch of philosophy that treats the genesis, processes, and structure of the universe. And the second is the astrophysical study of the structure and dynamics of the universe, sometimes called physical cosmology. And I thought this was nice in the sense that it actually captures uh, part of the theme of this talk, which is what is it, in fact the relation between these two different senses. So ever since Aristotle and Plato formulated cosmologies that were meant to give us an understanding of how the universe has 
a rationally comprehensible structure? This has been a central question in philosophy. How do we understand the structure of the universe? What's its source? How did it, uh, what's, what are the origins of that structure? And it's within the last hundred years that this has really become an active field within science. And so, one way of putting the question I'm going to be focusing on tonight is, to what extent has physical cosmology answered questions of the broad kind of scope that philosophers were considering in pursuing the kind of speculative cosmologies that have been a subject of discussion for uh, millennia? And I should uh, say up front, by the way, I guess this is a spoiler alert, uh, I'm not going to answer no to the question of my title, so um, it is, scientific cosmology clearly is possible. The question is, how is it possible, and how should we understand the limitations of physical cosmology as it relates to these broader questions that have been part of discussions of cosmology since the time of the ancient Greek philosophers. Um, but first, sorry, I'm too far away for this to work. So let me say a little bit about what's happened in the last century, because this has really been the century of cosmology in which we've had really dramatic transitions in how the scientifically educated public or the, uh, uh, how the sort of conventional wisdom of the scientific field treats questions about cosmology. So if we go back to around 1900, a little over a century ago, uh, if you had asked an astronomer at the time it's not clear that there was a completely uh, uh, clear consensus on these questions, but the largest structures that were actively being studied were actually the, the Milky Way galaxy. There were disputes about whether things that were called nebulae were actually structures outside the Milky Way or within. People had different views about this, but the uh, astronomers were actively trying to discern what the structure of the Milky Way galaxy was and how we were positioning that. And again, it's not entirely clear just because this wasn't a real focus of discussion at the time, but I think a lot of astronomers probably would have held that the structures we see like the Milky Way are static over time, sort of not changing on the largest scale, and perhaps eternally existing. So that would have been something like the conventional wisdom in 1900. Uh, things changed in 1917. Um, that was when Einstein published a paper in which he first considered using his new theory of gravity, general relativity, to construct a model of the entire universe, a cosmological model. So in some sense, the idea of describing the entire universe as a solution to a set of equations really originated in 1917 with this paper of Einstein's. Now I say here that he introduced the idea of dynamical cosmological models. That's actually not something, this is, the fact that he didn't introduce this is what Einstein in, uh, later called one of his biggest blunders. What he actually did in 1917 was introduce a static cosmological model. So I said that the conventional wisdom would have held that the universe is probably static. And Einstein's first cosmological model, he kind of forced his theory to give him a static model. But in fact, as people discovered a few years later, the most natural solutions within, within his theory were dynamical, meaning that at the largest scales, the universe is changing over time, it evolves with time. And that's a fairly natural consequence of his theory. So, um, but in addition to the theoretical, so uh, this is a nice quote from Malcolm Longyear, a distinguished astrophysicist and cosmologist. Uh, this was one of his mentors in graduate school. Uh, who encouraged him to consider doing something other than cosmology. Because he said, as of 1963, cosmology only has two and a half facts. So the sky is dark at night. Well, we kind of uh, have known that for a while. Um, the galaxies recede. And he classified this last, the claim that the universe is evolving as a half a fact because he was uncertain about whether that was accurate. Um, so I mention this to illustrate that even after Einstein had developed a theory that allowed you to describe the overall structure of the universe, the field languished for a while because there wasn't a lot of evidence that could bear on this. Um, it's actually, sorry, I, I'm leaving out one important ingredient, which is that the, the uh, sorry, I'm going to go back. So the, there was strong evidence for the fact that the uh, dynamical cosmological models were accurate with Hubble's observations of galaxies and a shift to thinking of the structure of the universe as revealed by the motion of galaxies rather than stars within the Milky Way. 
So that was an important ingredient that came along in the 20s and 30s, um, and that uh, is what led to the acceptance of dynamical cosmological models that describe the universe as expanding from an early state. But by 1963, it was still the case that cosmology was a data-starved science, and so uh, there are a lot of uh, there are a few cosmologists I've met who were working, and in 1963. Um, uh, it would have been as common to have a talk that would have been in the philosophy department rather than the physics department if you were working in cosmology, just because it wasn't a particularly <coughs> active field. So one thing that's important for any scientific field to be possible is to have a rich source of evidence to guide the development of a theory. And that's something that occurred uh, in cosmology. There's one particular source of evidence that was discovered just over 50 years ago. And so, for readers of the New York Times in 1965, they would have been greeted with this, uh, this story. This was on page A1, above the fold. So this was uh, big news. Uh, this was, of course, the famous discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation, which was done using a radio telescope in Holmdale, New Jersey, by Penzias and Wilson. So what they were able to observe is the radio uh, a signal left over from the primeval fireball, the early phase of the history of the Big Bang model. And the reason I emphasize this is that there's a huge, rich source of evidence that derives from looking at the photons of the background radiation. So Steven Weinberg, writing in 1977, said that one of the consequences of this discovery of the microwave background was that it got cosmologists to take the early universe seriously. In the sense that even though Einstein and others had studied expanding universes models from the 1920s onward, the idea that we could trust what those models told us, namely that there was a hot early phase in the universe's history, was not something most physicists took seriously. There were a few exceptions, but it was very much a small, uh, there are exceptions. So in 1965, this observation showed that you should take those models seriously in what they say about the early universe. And then this provided a source of evidence that actually is a very rich source of data about what the state of the early universe was. And so this is one of the more recent observations. This is from the Planck Commission that's funded by the European Space Agency that gives uh, information both about the temperature variations in the radiation that's coming to us from different parts of the sky. So the, the uh, colors here indicate temperature variations, and then the sort of Van Gogh-like swirls uh, indicate uh, measurements of polarization. That's another property of the light. And so what we have is a very, very rich source of data that gives us insight into the development of the early universe. So one thing that is certainly important in the development of a scientific field is a rich source of data that you can interpret relatively directly that then guides the development of theory. And that's one thing that the CMB has provided for physical cosmology over the last 50 years. Now this isn't the only source of data, so I'm just emphasizing that this is one of the ingredients that's important in looking at a scientific field. And this has certainly been significant. It's been awarded with uh, there have been two Nobel Prizes uh, awarded for work related to the CMB. And in some sense, this, uh, this is often called the universe's baby picture in the sense that what you're looking at as you look at the photons here uh, are photons that are left over from this period where they decouple from the plasma. So the photons no longer scatter off of the material constituents of the universe. And then they essentially, with some slight modifications, reach our telescope. So it's like really looking at a direct picture of the early state. Um, and it's estimated in current models to be when the universe is around 380,000 years old. So it's a, a picture of the early universe that tells us a lot, or tells cosmologists a lot. So, um, so what I've tried to do in a very quick summary, before going into some of the more philosophical parts of the talk, is to give you a sense of some of the changes that have happened in this cosmic century and a few of the ingredients. So, uh, and at the end now in 2017, we have a picture of the standard model of cosmology, as it's called, which gives us a very detailed account of how the universe has changed and developed over time. Now, I'm not going to, you know, 
do anything more than flash up a picture, but this is uh, the kind of thing that has led to detailed pictures of, uh, so here's the CMB that we saw in the Planck image before, and then there are all kinds of questions about how, uh, what happens during the dark ages before the first generation of stars form, exactly how the first stars form, how galaxies form later on, and so on, and how the universe's uh, uh, expansion changes over time. We have, within a century, after Einstein first sort of opened up this field, a very detailed picture of the historical evolution of the universe that uh, has a number of features that really give us confidence that aspects of this are on the right track. Let me mention just one of these. So this is something I mentioned already, that in Einstein's theory, you have a description of expanding universe models, which characterize how uh, things uh, expand over time, and so in particular we can look at how, I mean this is just a schematic, but you can look at how galaxies and other objects move apart, and then characterize the rate of expansion. Another important success of the standard model is looking at uh, a story of what happens within the first three minutes of the universe's history where you have the creation of light elements. Again, this is uh, something that has been worked out in detail since 1960. Five, and it gives you very compelling evidence that the standard model is on the right track. But let me, let me now shift gears to focus on two different things that this account of cosmology has achieved. There are two different things going on. So one is developing a historical reconstruction, explaining how the universe is structured and how that has changed over time, which I've given you a very sort of short overview of. Um, and in that development, we're using physics that has been developed for other reasons. So we have other reasons for accepting Einstein's theory of general relativity. It works in describing other things. Uh, in the account of how the elements formed, we're sort of taking nuclear physics that colleagues have developed for other reasons and asking how that applies in the early universe. So we have a lot of physical knowledge, which we're then extrapolating and applying to the, to the universe as a whole, and that gives us a, a way of understanding the universe's historical development. <clears throat> but there's also a different way in which cosmology is important, and this has become more important, uh, especially recently, that we want to also discover new things. We want to discover novel physics using cosmology as the primary testing ground. So there are some aspects of physics which only show up in cosmology. So the only way that we'll be able to, to determine properties of this new physics is by studying cosmology. And I think this actually brings in new challenges. So how is it that we can use cosmology to justify new ideas in physics or to discover these new features of physics? So note that in the, in the case of the reconstruction, we're really looking at physics that has sort of independent credentials. We've already been convinced that we know how nuclear physics works, and we're taking it off the shelf and applying it. In this case, we're using cosmology to, to justify new physical theories. And the challenge that arises is that cosmology isn't like other aspects of physics. So in particular, the uh, if we're really talking about aspects of the universe as a whole and not subsystems of the universe, that's very different than other aspects of physics. And the universe is only given to us once. The universe is unique. It's not something that we can take samples of or run experiments on. And the question that I'm going to be focusing on for the rest of the talk is, do these distinctive aspects of cosmology lead to specific new challenges that are different in cosmology than in other areas of physics. So let me be a little bit more specific then and think about three questions. So because of these features of cosmology, this distinctive aspect of it, are there limits to what we can know about the cosmos? Are there specific limits that arise in cosmology because we're trying to formulate the theory of the whole and because we have a unique object? Secondly, does cosmology require some new kind of method? Is there some alternative to the way other physicists work that cosmologists have to adopt. And finally, what principles or co assumptions does cosmology require? 
Again, are there distinctive principles that come into play in understanding the structure of cosmological models? Sorry, I keep walking too far away from this to work. So, um, first I want to say something briefly about uh, some kind of skeptical positions in cosmology that motivate the claim that, uh, that motivate answers to these questions that I'm, for the most part, going to reject, but at least I'll get the skeptical arguments on the table. And then I want to look at two specific cases uh, where cosmology appears to be distinctive. One is with regard to talking about global properties of the universe as a whole, and then a second is looking at uh, the origins of the universe. So uh, we can go back to Kant. So uh, Kant was actually, uh, surprisingly, he made some contributions to cosmology. He was one of the people who uh, formulated the nebular hypothesis that uh, systems like the solar system or perhaps larger systems could have formed by condensing from a nebula. So he was actually thinking about uh, cosmology in a very concrete sense. But he was also very critical of, in his day, the sort of philosophy and speculative cosmologies that have been developed by Leibniz, Wolf, and other people in his sort of uh, philosophical milieu. So he was actually concerned about whether uh, the sort of cosmologies that would have been advocated in a German university at the time were even coherent. And so, in specific, he, specifically, he was worried about whether we could coherently form concepts that we apply to the whole universe. And so, to illustrate the problems he saw, um, there's a part of the critique of pure reason, pure reason called the antinomies, where he formulates arguments, and these are the kinds of arguments that were under consideration by his contemporaries, where he formulates arguments which are meant to be compelling both for the thesis and the antithesis. And the conclusion is not that he will argue in favor of one of these. He actually thinks that there's a confusion going on in the way that these problems are set up. And so in this case, um, he thinks that trying to argue whether the world has a beginning in time or is finite in space or the opposite really results from a mistake. But he thinks that we can't actually think of the universe as a whole. That's not something that we can ever experience. We never grasp the whole universe at once. We only have access to parts of it. So it's not a possible object of experience that has a particularly loaded uh, sense for Kant. But the, res uh, the, the response to this situation then is that neither of these is actually a correct argument. Instead, we should think of space and time as both finite yet extendable, um, as appearances. And again, that's uh, a technical term for Kant. The important point I want to take away from this is that Kant is very skeptical of whether we can formulate concepts that apply to the whole universe. So if you want to say for Kant that the universe as a whole, as a whole is expanding, he thinks that that's not really, uh, you can't really use concepts like that in a consistent way. And this is a skepticism a lot of other people have expressed as well. Is it possible to formulate concepts of the whole universe as opposed to applying concepts to smaller subregions or parts of the universe? <clears throat> so now I want to look at a different form of skepticism, and this is also something that has been voiced at various points. Uh, most recently, there's a nice expression of this by Lee Smolin. Uh, Smolin argues that we shouldn't think of cosmology as just taking local physics and extrapolating it. Because local physics, by local physics what I mean is the physics you develop by looking at subsystems, the system you can isolate on your lab bit, think of that as a local system, and then you understand how physics applies to that. Uh, most cosmologists would say we start with physics and we extrapolate what we've learned in that case to apply to larger and larger regions, or in, indeed to the whole universe. Smolin thinks that that can't work, that there's a mistake in trying to uh, apply the same kind of ideas to cosmology. And so let me just read, this is from a 2013 paper, the method which has worked so well for physics up till now has broken down because it's only suitable for explaining phenomena of subsystems of the universe. The questions we now face are cosmological and we need a new approach to them. And then he, uh, this is, a one-line summary of his different approach. I'm not going to discuss that in detail, but the
claim is that there's something problematic about using uh, a, an approach that only works for subsystems and trying to apply that to the universe as a whole. So the problem is that when people have tried to formulate alternative methods that stand in place of whatever it is that we have been doing, namely taking lo local physics and extrapolating it, it hasn't been a particular, particularly successful endeavor. So there was a, a similar argument made <coughs> by a group of British cosmologists uh, who developed what's called the steady state theory. Again, their motivation was that you had to adopt a different kind of methodology and cosmology in order to be able to proceed. That led to a very specific theory, which then has not stood the test of time. This is one of those rare cases where a theory really does have a clear end date. Um, and 1965 is when the steady state theory passed uh, from this earth. Um, <laughs> Smolin's uh, uh, idea is more recent, and so it's not as clear uh, how it's going to play out. But again, it's a very different approach to cosmology, which is quite speculative, but it's based on this idea that we should have a, a different alternative method. So um, let me now, so I've stated two skeptical arguments. One is that we somehow can't apply our concepts to the universe as a whole, that that's an uh, incoherent idea and another that we need to adopt a different methodology in cosmology. Um, in some sense, I think Einstein's 1917 paper actually resolved the first of these objections. He just showed how you could write down a cosmological model that describes the whole universe in his theory. And that cosmological model has well-defined global properties. So in a sense, if his theory is correct, it gives you a way of describing uh, global properties. So, um, and as I said, the first cosmological model was one that is static and it's bounded. So it's a cosmological model in which uh, spatially, uh, if you go long enough in one direction, you come back uh, to the point where you started. Um, I'm going to skip the point about Mach's principle. But I think this is uh, really answering this first question. So these were the two skeptical challenges. Can we coherently form concepts of the whole universe? I think it's clear that at least if general relativity is the theory you're using to describe the universe at the largest scales, we can give a consistent global description. But, and this is what I'm going to turn to next, these global properties are not accessible in a very clear sense. Um, and then secondly, does cosmology require a distinctive method well, the current standard model, which I gave a very brief summary of, is really based on extrapolation of local physics. It's been incredibly successful. And so far, it doesn't seem that there are really compelling alternatives for an account of method that could stand in place of starting with local physics and extrapolating. <clears throat> so let me now turn to the questions about access. So, there are two features of uh, cosmological models as described by general relativity that are essential here. The first is that the speed of light is finite. And so what I've uh, illustrated here is a space-time diagram that illustrates the consequence of the finite speed of light. So uh, in this diagram, you should think of time going up and space going across. So think of this plane as representing the surface that we saw a picture of earlier, that's sometimes called the surface of last scattering. And if we, uh, a world line here would represent our galaxy <coughs> as it's moving uh, along through time, or our world line. So because the speed of light is finite, as you follow a light beam back, as it's going further from you, it's also going back in time, because it takes some time for those signals to reach you. And so what this past light cone, as it's called, represents is the region of space-time, the region of the four-dimensional space-time that this model describes, from which signals could reach you. So anything that is within this light cone is something that if, uh, if there is a signal from that point, it could reach you either at going at or below the speed of light. So if there's an event down here, you could get the signal from it. If it's out here, it would have to go faster than the speed of light in order to have it reach you, but that's not allowed according to relativity. There's no signal that goes 
faster than the speed of light. So what this represents is that if we look at our world line, there will be the past light cone will uh, intersect a surface of constant time, such as the surface that we saw in the, uh, the picture of the background radiation. And anything that's further than that is something that we'll never see. The signal from uh, light from that source will never reach us. Well, it, so one thing to be a little bit more careful about, uh, as time goes on, of course, our past light cone will uh, spread and it will hit a little bit more. But uh, overall, this marks the horizon just in the same sense as the horizon of the Earth marks the limit of what you can, uh, of what you can see. So this marks the limit of what we can see in the space-time because of the finite speed of light. Now there's another feature of general relativity which is important for understanding why we have, will have trouble uh, making claims about global properties. And that's that it's actually incredibly flexible. So Einstein's theory, the main equations in Einstein's theory say that in any given small region of space-time, at any given point, there's going to be a relationship between how curved space-time is at that point and how much matter and energy density is present at that point. So that's a local requirement that those two have to match up appropriately in order for Einstein's equations to be satisfied. So the amount of matter determines how curved space-time is and they have to be uh, in that relationship. But that's only a, an equation that constrains locally what's going on. And globally, you can actually have all kinds of crazy things going on in terms of the global structure of the space-time. So Einstein had to have this flexibility because you want to describe gravity and all the different ways in which uh, bodies can move around and be configured in a theory where space-time curvature is what you're using to describe gravity. So you had to be flexible in how you describe space-time curvature in order to model all the different situations in which you want to apply the theory. So this flexibility is essential to the theory, but it means that globally, so uh, unlike other theories which had global structure which was fixed, Einstein has to be flexible and there's freedom in understanding what the global properties are. Let me give you an example of a global property. So, I mentioned that Einstein's universe, his initial model, was treated as spatially bounded. So we can, uh, that's such that the, uh, if you followed a curve around in that universe, you'd eventually come back to the starting point. So we could define that the space time is spatially bounded if there's a maximum spatial distance between any two points. So you can't be further apart than that distance. That's a natural way of defining what it means for it to be bounded. So an infinite space or an unbounded space, you can be arbitrarily far away. Um, and there are some properties that space times have to have in order for this to be a well-defined property. But when I say that Einstein's theory is flexible, it doesn't stipulate whether its models will be bounded or not. They could be either. That's a global property. It isn't stipulated in advance. And so you can have some solutions which are bounded and some which are not. So now we have two features of Einstein's theory. First, the existence of past light cones that are just due to the speed of light being finite, and its great flexibility when it comes to describing the global properties of space-time. And one way to think about how these inter interact is that, and this is a, a, an analogy due to, to John Norton, if you think about constructing a space-time model, or a way of describing the entire universe in Einstein's theory, it's almost like putting together a puzzle. Because the theory gives you local constraints that tell you what each puzzle piece has to look like. And then you can try to put them together and assemble them to give a global description of the solution. And so uh, we can ask them for different combinations. Can we patch things together to form a global solution? Um, I'll learn eventually that I need to be closer. Um, <laughs> So, uh, and I have small kids, and so uh, they enjoy Shel Silverstein, so uh, this is uh, a poem in which uh, it was evocative for me in any case. So, uh, Silverstein is imagining a jigsaw puzzle or a picture puzzle piece lying on the sidewalk and imagining all the different possibilities, all the different puzzles that that could fit into. And I've actually left out all the very wonderful Shel Silverstein style descriptions of the different possibilities, but 
In this case, you can ask the same kind of question. If we think of the local regions of space-time as something like this puzzle piece, you can ask, what are the possibilities if we're just given the data on our past <coughs> lifetime? That's like one puzzle piece. And what can that be part of? What can that fit together with in order to form a global space-time? And so, if we're given our observations and everything we see on this past light cone, what can we construct? What can we put together to make a full space-time? And uh, so, for example, could we have an unbounded space-time or a bounded space-time? Well, it should be fairly clear that, uh, and this is actually something that people have considered explicitly, if you just take a space-time where you imagine cutting this and then taping it together so that it connects up, it turns out that you can get a space-time that has that kind of structure. It seems bizarre, but you can do that. As long as you wrap it up in a way such that it's a little bit larger than this, the past light cone, you can have a bounded space-time in which this light cone has the features that it has. So you can construct a bounded space-time given the space, the, the, the past light cone that you started with. And so this is a case where uh, uh, John Manchak, who was here at Washington when he was doing this work, you can actually give a very clear uh, description of the possibilities where um, you can ask, uh, which space time do we inhabit given the information on our past light cone? And there's a large class of space times that will be indistinguishable in the sense that the past light cone that we happen to have could be fit into many different space times. And so we could think about the uh, puzzle analogy here. If we imagine that we have a set of puzzle pieces, which are the data on our past light cones, you can construct a space time out of those in one way, but you can also construct a different space time by adding perhaps in other puzzle pieces, but every light cone will still have a place in an alternative space time. Now, the point of this is that um, this is just really a very precise way of making it clear that our observations on our past light cone aren't sufficient to determine what the global properties of the space-time are. You might think that's unsurprising, but this is a nice way of making it precise. So if you ask, what are the global properties? Is the space-time in, I'm in unbounded or bounded? And I just give you the data on the past light cone, if that's all you have as the basis for making your decision, you should say, I can't decide, because my past light cone is compatible with either of those possibilities. Now, um, in light of this, you might ask, well, didn't I say earlier that one of the successes of the standard model is that it uses these expanding uni uh, universe models to describe the overall structure of space and time? Why is it that, and so this is saying that there's certain global properties of the universe that's expanding and has uh, these structures. Well, in describing the expanding universe models, you typically make an assumption that you can uh, formulate more, more precisely, but it's an assumption that these different observers, these different galaxies, are equivalent in a precise sense. And so if you make an assumption like that, if you say all of these observers are equivalent, <laughs> then you can say something more substantial about the global properties of the space time. But then there's an awkward follow-up question. Well, how do you justify that principle? Because the claim that all the observers are equivalent is a global claim about the nature of space and time. So if you imagine trying to start off from just what you see in the past light cone, you can't directly justify these claims about the global properties of space and time. Okay, so... Global properties of cosmological models are well-defined. We can talk about these. They're mathematically consistent. There's nothing like Kant's worries that arise here. But any claims about them will require something like a principle of uniformity. So if you have one of these principles, uh, if you've assumed that that's true, then you can make claims about the global properties. But otherwise, uh, otherwise not. Okay, so... Now I want to shift to looking at questions about the origins of the universe. And this is the last section of the talk. So uh, this is a quote from David Schramm, uh, a cosmologist at Chicago, uh, one of the leading figures in the um, early uh, interplay between particle physics and cosmology. 
I just love this quote because it gives you a sense of how cosmologists at the time were looking at the early universe. So it says, 15 billion years ago, an experiment was carried out. This is the experiment we call the Big Bang. It resulted in lots of bits of data spread out over essentially the part of the universe we can see, our past uh, light cone. We know that the original apparatus had about 10 to the 19 GeV, which is pleasing because it's such a high energy scale. But unfortunately, the graduate student who designed this equipment is no longer around. And as a result, she can't tell us what she did. Um, so we have to try to piece together the data on our own to see if we can understand what happened in this experiment. So what was so appealing to particle physicists who started to move into cosmology in the 1980s was that, and I'm sorry, you might not be able to, to read this that well, but this is just a, a, a diagram illustrating that as you go back towards the Big Bang, the temperature and the energy scales go up. And why is that exciting? Well, because if you're interested in novel physical effects that are only relevant at really high energy scales, then you can study them by trying to understand what happened in the early universe. And the Soviet cosmologist Yakov Seldovich called this the poor man's accelerator because it's much cheaper to build telescopes to look at the early universe than to try to build an accelerator that would get up to that kind of energy scale. Um, so it was quite appealing to look to the early universe to try to understand uh, whether we could see signs of new physics um, at that scale. Because uh, 10 to the 9 GeV was not something, uh, and still is not something that you're going to reach in an earthbound accelerator. But there's um, um, an important question about how to think about uh, the application of physics to the early universe. Uh, there's a concept that George Ellis has called the physics horizon, which is uh, like the horizon before, but it's not something that's due to the finite speed of light. It's just due to our knowledge of physics. And the, the, the thing that is exciting about the early universe for people doing fundamental physics is that we go past the point of where we understand the physics well, and so we cross what Ellis called the physics horizon. But that's also a challenge. So what I mean by that, the physics horizon, just the boundary between physics that we can test by non-cosmological -co experiments or observations, and things lying beyond that boundary, things that we're only testing through their implications for cosmology. Now the challenge is, um, so can we actually justify theories whose only novel implications lie beyond the physics horizon through their implications for cosmology. Okay, so, um, and here's some problems. Here's some immediate thoughts about why this is problematic. Well, we can't actually experiment with the universe as a whole. Um, as David Tram said, the graduate student also didn't leave records of how she designed the experiment, so we don't actually know that much about the, so let me put the problem in slightly different terms. As we go closer and closer to the Big Bang, our level of ignorance increases. So the way Schramm described this is that we don't know what the graduate student did to design the experiment, but we just know less and less about the early universe as we get to early and earlier times. So that makes it harder to extract information from the experiment because we don't know how the experiment was set up. We don't know what the conditions were in the very early universe in order to make uh, inferences. And secondly, we can't compare our universe with an ensemble of other universes. So if you were wondering how things could play out differently, um, you could try rerunning the universe over and over again, right? Just try creating another universe and see what happens and see if it looks like ours. That would help you discern what was just sort of an accidental feature of our universe or something that is necessary to it being the kind of universe it is. But we don't have an ensemble like that. We only got one. So we have a very small sample size. And so this way of approaching things where you try to compare things with an ensemble also doesn't work. So this can lead you to be very skeptical. Again, that going back to the fact that cosmology seems to be different than other areas, and thinking that, look, we can't do experiments in the way we do in other fields. We can't observe a sample of other uh, things of the same kind and use that to uh, 
uh, assess our ideas. So, and some people have then drawn the conclusion, well, maybe it's just the case that we cannot test novel physics and cosmology, anything that's beyond the physics horizon. Now, I think that this is a, an argument that a lot of people have accepted, but I actually think that there's some problematic assumptions about scientific method embedded in this argument. So in order for these two claims to lead to the conclusion, you have to make some strong assumptions about scientific method, which I think are actually quite limited. So let me say briefly why I think that, and give an account of scientific method which would allow for uh, discovery of novel physics. So let's think about planetary astronomy as an example. So in some sense, well, until recently, until this discovery of exoplanets, for uh, the time in which the uh, planetary astronomy has developed from Newton up until very recently, we only had one example of the solar system that we could study. So, and how did we develop more and more confidence in Newtonian gravity as the main interaction describing the solar system? It was in part because we got more and more sophisticated descriptions of the solar system. And so as we progress, we are able to keep developing an account of the solar system in which the motions were due to Newtonian gravity under the pressure of increasingly accurate and increasingly precise observations. So um, the fact that we were able to do that then gives us a sense that we've successfully tested the theory. And so, for example, one of the details we discovered is that there's a further planet, Neptune, by looking at the orbit of Uranus. Um, and the fact that we were able to discover the orbit of Neptune, based on successfully applying the theory, gives us more confidence that we're on the right track. And of course, it's a much more complicated story than that. But all I want to emphasize is that I think there's a natural way in think, uh, of thinking that what we've done is gain more and more detailed information about a unique system rather than looking at an ensemble of systems, and there's really no uh, experimental evidence that's important to this development. Um, and so we have a case that looks like a counterexample to the claim that you can't justify a theory uh, with, without the kind of experiment and observation that was assumed in the previous argument. Um, so the question then is, can we think of this kind of approach as it applies in the early universe? So, what I'm arguing is then that we should think of testing a theory as more like a long-term achievement. And the question is not uh, evaluating the theory initially, but how stringently is the theory tested through further research and the development of further ideas based on it. And so um, the, the way I think about uh, what I mean by how stringently is the theory tested if you accept a theory as the way of understanding phenomena, you're in some sense taking on a risk. The theory could be incorrect. And the question is, how do you manage that risk? How do you keep from being convinced that the theory is right, even though it's in fact wrong? And I think if you look at history of physics, there are various kinds of methods that you can see at work in the development of physical theories, which you can think of as ways of trying to mitigate the risk, ways of trying to convince you that you're on the right track. Uh, the one that I mentioned is that new discoveries that are independently confirmable um, uh, convince you that you're on the right track. So Neptune was discovered based on its perturbative effect on Uranus. But then, of course, you can take the telescope and see Neptune directly. So there you have an independent way of confirming that the physical detail you discovered <coughs> due to its gravitational effects is actually present. And so you've discovered new features of the solar system based on your use of the Newtonian theory. And that should give you confidence that Newtonian theory was leading you in the right direction as opposed to um, leading you in the wrong direction. So I won't talk about the other two, but I think those are three examples of strategies that can be used in trying to develop and test a theory over time and to mitigate the risks of accepting a theory. So, let me now turn to a very recent debate that focuses on the early universe. And this is a, uh, a quotation from a paper by uh, Anna Ias, Paul Steinhardt, and Avi Loeb that appeared in Scientific American. And the, uh, the, uh, a section of the paper reads as follows. Inflationary cosmology, which, a, which is a proposal about how the very early history of the universe unfolded, 
Um, they say, as we currently understand it, cannot be evaluated using the scientific method. Various features make inflation so flexible that no experiment can ever disprove it. Some scientists accept that inflation is untestable, untestable but refuse to abandon it. They have proposed that instead science must change by discarding one of its defining properties, empirical testability. So as I'm sure you can imagine, saying of other scientists that the idea that they're developing is not scientific is kind of the equivalent of calling your opponent either a fascist or a communist uh, in a political debate. It's certainly not a, a popular move. And so this was uh, a very polemical piece that then occasioned a response in the subsequent issue of Scientific American where I believe it was 32 uh, people co-signed a letter saying no inflation is scientific. But I think what's interesting is actually that the central issue in this debate is partly what does it mean to say that a theory is empirically testable and how does that idea apply to inflation? And again, there was, uh, the argument I was just making is that we need to think of how we evaluate theories in a broader sense than just the idea that you have to have experiments or observations, but that we can think of uh, what it means to test a theory or evaluate a theory in terms of the long-term development of the, of the theory. So I want to see how that view uh, applies in this case. So just to, to say immediately, um, I'm not going to talk about inflation in a lot of detail, but inflation is able to explain, well, inflation can account for many of the features of the, the picture I showed of the back background radiation earlier in the talk. That's the, the picture from Planck, gives you information about the variation in temperature, and inflation is compatible with all that information. There are other competing ideas that didn't, that didn't pan out. Um, so that's an important success. So inflation is still compatible with all the data we have, including the data from the CMP. But I think we can ask, to what extent have subsequent developments addressed risks associated with accepting the theory? And the possibility that really inflation is successful, as EOS et al. are worried, just because it manages to fit the data because it's very flexible. So how can we address that worry? Um, and I think First of all, we have to distinguish between different versions of inflation in order to answer this question. So you could think of inflation as just a merely phenomenological theory. By that I mean you don't actually care what the underlying thing that causes inflation is. Again, sorry, I didn't actually say this. Inflation is a period of exponential expansion in the very early universe. So uh, the universe is expanding as we observe it now. But if inflation is true, there was a period where the universe in the very, very early moments went through a much faster burst of expansion. And it's natural to ask, well, what would have caused that period of expansion and how did it come to an end? Um, a phenomenological approach of inflation just says, well, we're not going to specify the source of inflation. We'll just take it as defined by uh, that feature that has a period of accelerated expansion. A second approach to inflation says, no, there's a specific physical source. I'm going to write down a field. That field is going to drive inflation. And then that field has various properties. And I can ask how it links up with other fields that are part of the particle physics description. And finally, and this is really what EOS et al. are really responding to, there's the idea that maybe inflation leads to a multiverse um, in which different physical realizations, so I mean different ways of producing inflation, are uh, uh, active in different regions. And so the picture that we have for the multiverse, uh, I think most talks I've seen about the multiverse use this image, so now I can check that off my to-do list. This is an image from Andre Linde from quite a while ago in a Scientific American article. But it's meant to illustrate the idea that in an inflationary multiverse, the picture that you have of the global structure of space-time is that you have bubbles that have different properties. That's what the colors are meant to represent. And uh, each of these would have different properties. Some of them might have uh, an inflationary phase that corresponds to what we see. Others might not. But the way that you explain the properties that we see in the CMV on this account is that there's Somewhere in the, some parts of this ensemble will have physics that's compatible with what we observe. And so the idea is that, well, maybe uh, some of these have the right properties that we could be located there. And 
then you say, what ex explanation does inflationary, the, this multiverse picture provide of what we actually observe? Well, we have this ensemble that's created, and then there are regions of that ensemble that are compatible with what we observe. Now, I think the natural question is, how can this be further tested? So, uh, given what we said about accessibility of global properties earlier, we're never actually going to see this kind of multiverse structure. And the other problem is that it's not actually clear how to uh, develop the idea further in order to give a richer account of what you should expect to see. So it's not clear how you can have an analog of the development of Newtonian theory, where you learn more and more about the details of the multiverse um, as a result of this theory. Instead, it seems to just give you an explanation of why what you see is compatible with the multiverse. So in that sense, it seems like a, a dead end. It doesn't seem like there's a way of going forward with the multiverse idea that allows you to refine and develop it. So I think the kind of strategies I described earlier are really only applicable in the case of having specific models for inflation. So in that case, if you have not just a claim that inflation occurred, but a specific model describing how inflation occurred in the physical source, then you can try to discover new features of the early universe, develop a more detailed account, or fix the properties of the inflaton field, and apply some of the strategies uh, I noted earlier. And here the challenges really um, don't have anything to do with the uniqueness of the universe, which is what was originally worrying us about scientific method in this case. Instead, we have challenges just based on how, how many constraints do we have on the space of models of this type? Um, how much do we know that would allow us to, to specify what the models must be? Uh, do we actually have independent access? Could we do anything like seeing Neptune if there was a prediction that there was some physical detail that had to be in place? Or do we lack that kind of independent access? And finally, there is something that uh, is specific in this case, which is that uh, we don't know that much about what happened before inflation, and so there's always the possibility of playing off changes to what happened before inflation with inflation. And that, that's a specific difficulty because of the, the case of cosmology that we know even less as we go further and further back. So what I want to emphasize is just that these challenges actually seem more kind of prosaic challenges about how we go about testing new areas of physics where we have limited access. They don't actually seem to have a lot to do with cosmology specifically and the worries about the uniqueness of the universe with which we started. So, in essence, then, I'm arguing that there are really important challenges to making the case in favor of inflation, but I don't think you can track them back to uh, the uniqueness of the universe in the way that uh, they sometimes are. Okay, so let me close now with response to the questions I started with. So, I had three questions. What are the limits to what we can know about the cosmos? Uh, does cosmology require a distinctive method? And finally, what principles or assumptions does cosmology require? And for the first question, I said, well, once we have general relativity, we can define global properties of the entire universe, but those are inaccessible in a really direct sense. Um, there's the other limit that arises just because of the problems of accessibility, that we have limited accessibility to physics uh, of the early universe. Um, and I've overall argued that cosmology doesn't seem to require a distinctive method. And that the challenges we see in understanding what happened in the early universe are due to the inaccessibility of that regime rather than uh, any, uh, than the use of an inappropriate method, as other, uh, other people have suggested. And finally, what principles or assumptions does cosmology require? Um, if we want to make inferences, draw conclusions from what we see locally about what the global features of space-time will be, will be, we need some kind of principle like a principle of uniformity. I'm not saying we need that one specifically, but we need a principle of that sort to draw those sorts of conclusions. And finally, this is something I didn't uh, emphasize uh, throughout, but we're assuming throughout this discussion that the physics we've discovered applies universally, so we're always extrapolating local physics to apply to the universe. Okay, so uh, uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to questions and discussion.
So now we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, would you like me to handle them? Uh, I, can, sure. I can try to keep track of hands. Yeah, I'll try to call on hands. Uh, yes. So uh, we'll open the floor to questions. Yes, here. So, and can I, we ask you to speak up? Okay. So I want. I'm, I want to know your opinion about the cosmological constant problem, mm -hmm. which is crucial for the evolution of cosmology. So, um, so the cosmological constant problem is a problem that arises when you try to combine quantum field theory and general relativity. Yeah. And so uh, if you take uh, the kind of naive way of calculating what the vacuum energy density should be from quantum field theory, then you get an answer that's uh, really um, dramatically too large. It's sometimes said to be 120 orders of magnitude too big compared to what you'd see in, uh, or what you see in cosmology. So you can put direct constraints on what that constant should be uh, within cosmology. Now, <clears throat> the, I'm guessing the reason you pose the question is a lot of people think that the best argument in favor of the multiverse is that it gives a solution to the cosmological constant problem. Um, I really, uh, I think there's a lot of assumptions that have to go into that argument, but here's, here's the way that the argument is usually presented. So, uh, so I've said, look, the cosmological constant, uh, we expect it to be huge, right? And so the puzzle is, why is it so small um, compared to our expectations? And if you imagine that you have an ensemble where the cosmological constant just varies from bubble to bubble of that ensemble. And then you say, well, we'll only be found in elements of that ensemble in which the cosmological constant is within some range. Because if it's too big, then you don't have time for the universe to get to be the size it is with things like galaxies. If it's too small, you don't get galaxies either. So you think there's only some range of values that's possible. And then you say, well, what should we expect to see for the cosmological constant? Well, we're, we're just a random choice from within that range. And so we actually, uh, Weinberg has a 1987 paper where he predicts the cosmological constant should be basically a random value within that range. And that was actually reasonably close to what we observed much later as compared to the calculation that was 120 orders of magnitude off. Now, um, does that justify the belief in the multiverse? Yes. Uh, I, 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 I don't buy that argument. <laughs> um, so, so here's a few things that are puzzling about that to me. One is, why should we assume that we're a random element of the ensemble? Why should we uh, as make a kind of typicality assumption there? It's more like we do not know the fundamental theories to predict the vacuum energy requirements. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I'm much more comfortable saying something like that, that there's, we're ignorant about exactly how to understand vacuum energy. Um, but I don't think that the success uh, of Weinberg's prediction should uh, really count heavily in favor of the multiverse. That's what I, I just don't see how that argument is meant to be compelling. But uh, <coughs> maybe there's a. Do you have a follow up? Or? Yeah, but I mean, it's. I mean, do we have some perfect solution for this problem, which is really nature just as the general relativity? Well, I mean, from the point of view of general relativity, um, so Carlo Rovelli has a nice paper with uh, uh, Bianchi about this, in which they say, from the point of view of general relativity, you can just treat it like a constant. And it's not, it's only when you bring in the considerations yeah. of quantum field theory that you have this expectation that this should have a huge value compared to what it does have. Because uh, general relativity is classical, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, and we don't understand how to combine quantum field theory and general relativity. Uh, this might be just an aspect of our ignorance of that, but um, from the point of view just of general relativity and cosmology, you can just treat it as one of the parameters that's fixed by observations. Do we have other questions? Yes. Um, what, what do you make of various attempts that, that uh, people have undergone to address this assumption of um, universality of physics? I, I don't remember details, but I know there is some uh, studies done trying to detect 
changes in, for example, the fine spectral constant yeah. over over cosmological time based on uh, I assume changes in spectra. Or spectra of quasars, yeah. 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 No, this is so. Uh, a very natural way to test this assumption of universality is to say, well, let's look and see if we can see some variations in things that we think should be constant. So, um, the uh, there's actually there's a, there's a really cool example of this, which you might not have heard of. This is uh, a region in Africa called it's called the Oklo phenomenon, which is that there's a there's a spot in I forget exactly where it is, but uh, there is a uranium mine where they discovered that the some of the uranium had undergone um, <coughs> fission reactions. The, the, the isotope ratios were wrong. And this was discovered initially in the 60s, and people thought, well, maybe somebody's actually building a reactor or something. So they were very curious about it in the Cold War era. But what they realized later is that this was an area where you had just uh, the right physical conditions. You had water flowing through an area of uranium ore where there was the water acted as uh, effectively a, uh, to slow the neutrons down, and it actually was just a natural fission reaction took place. Um, now this is interesting because it took place quite a while ago, and then you can ask, was nuclear physics the same in that case? Can we constrain whether nuclear physics, the processes occurred in the same way we expect, so that all the constants have the same value, when that occurred. And you can actually put a constraint on that based on your understanding of that phenomenon. So there's all kinds of cases like this where you can say, here's a phenomenon that took place some time ago, and we can study it now with enough precision to ask, was nuclear physics the same when that series of natural reactions took place compared to what it is now? And the answer is yes. Um, so in that case, you can put constraints on whether physics change over, I think it's like a billion years, you know, some pretty substantial length of time based on that evidence. <laughs> and then you can also look at quasars and see if there's a shift in the spectra of quasars due to a variation in the fine structure constant and other constants. You can see if there's any evidence that they're changing. And so far, uh, there was evidence for a while that seemed to indicate that the fine structure constant was changing, but I don't think that held up. Um, so I think right now it's uh, a fairly safe bet that the uh, assumption of universality is compatible with everything we've seen. And in some sense, that's an amazing test of physics, right? Because you're assuming that the physics you've discovered applies in the same way in these very different situations where the physical conditions are quite varied, and you understand the physics well enough that you've gotten it right in the way you're describing those other systems. Next question. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious about how you see this uniformity principle um, in relation to other areas of physics, especially right. So there's this big movement in particle physics. We think of all of our theories as effective theories. One part of this is thinking that all of our theories are going to break down somewhere. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the uniformity principle is somehow in conflict with that? Right, because you might think assuming that the laws are going to apply everywhere is the exact opposite of assuming that they're going to break down somewhere. Uh, so, are you, so uh, the uniformity principle, uh, do you mean universality or uni the, the way I was? So I wasn't. Yeah, you, universality. Yeah, yeah. So universality, again, I think the, you're right that you would expect. Uh, uh, so what you expect from that point of view is that there's very specific regimes where you expect your theories to break down, but you also have the opposite expectation that in some other regimes, you think that you have an effective theory that characterizes things sufficiently well. So I think physicists would mainly say that in the very high, ener in the very high energies, we don't understand exactly what's going on. But for, for like low energies, and. Uh, those regimes, we actually think we have an accurate description. So I think it wouldn't be, yeah, so universality, I'd have to qualify it a bit to say there's a domain in which you think your theory holds, and within that domain you think it applies, uh, you, you think it applies universally. Yes, next question. Isn't there an intrinsic problem if you push cosmology back to the initial singularity? and you believe quantum mechanics works there, then you're trying to describe probabilities that it really is only one event. 
Ah, uh, good question. So this is, um, so, yeah, so first of all, I think uh, the, the claim that there's an initial singularity is based on extending classical general relativity all the way back. And if you try to combine relativity with quantum mechanics, it will almost certainly modify the picture at the very earliest stages. And one thing it might do is get rid of the singularities. So there's always that possibility. But the, the question you're asking is, well, um, if you ask about a combination of quantum mechanics and relativity, excuse me, could you do something like calculate the probability that the early state of the universe had a certain value. Um, and this is something a lot of people who formulated theories of quantum gravity have, have tried to do, like there's something called the Hartle-Hawking wave function, where you say, here's the initial state of the universe, and we'll assign a probability density over different possibilities. So if you combine quantum uh, mechanics and relativity, you would get a way of assigning probability in that context. But I mean, in some sense, it's going back to this question. Right. That's saying that there is a real limitation. Ah, I see where you're going. Yeah, no, that's true. You might have, um, you might only be able to calculate conditional probabilities then, given if the early universe state was this, then there'd be a, a conditional probability for later features of the universe. So I'm, I'm wondering uh, if you could elaborate on this um, like, what constitutes validation in? In cosmology, you talked a little bit about how inflation was validated in a certain in a certain sense. Um, if you have a lot of different scientific theories and you have very limited refinements on the data you have access to, some of them should be validated, right? So it's not clear that um, you move forward right. in that sense. Right. Good. I mean, I think the um, one question is. Uh, how much of a test has, been, has inflation been put to by the current evidence we have? So I said it's compatible with all the evidence we have, but you, there's a natural sense that you want to say, how, how severely has it been tested, or how, how much has it really been um, probed by that set of evidence that we have? And I think the, um, there's a lot of ways in which it hasn't been probed that rigorously, and that's there's a lot of, so one way of asking it is, how much do you put in in, in describing the in dynamics of inflation? How much information are you adding? And then how much of that is actually constrained by the evidence that you have available? And the problem is, is that uh, when you're describing inflation, you have to first describe the, the features of the, of the, it's usually called the inflaton field that will lead to this stage of expansion. And then you have to describe features that uh, show how expansion ends in a way that's compatible with the rest of the standard model of cosmology. And that seems to be an independent feature of inflation that you have to sort of put in by now. And so I think right now there's a pretty worrisome case that it looks like you can, you know, you can fit the data, but it looks like you might merely be fitting the data, right? So it's an achievement that is compatible with the data. But if you look at other cases from the history of physics, you have massively over-constrained the problem. So it's not, if you ask why do we believe that atoms exist, you can say there's a variety of phenomena that establish what the atomic scale properties have to be in order to be compatible with all the different lines of evidence we have. That's a case where you can say you've massively over-constrained the problem. And that's certainly not the case of inflation. And, and so I think the worry is that just because of our limitations, because we can't build uh, or we can't build accelerators large enough, or we don't have other ways of probing the physics of, of, of that scale, we might be in the depressing situation of having a theory that's compatible with everything we have, but that isn't over-constrained, and isn't sort of uh, really tied down by the evidence in the way that other cases have been in the history of physics. So I think that, that I mean, that's, that's my take on the case of inflation right now. It's compatible with everything we see, but I think you can't really say that it's been thoroughly tested by the evidence that we currently have. Are there other theories that are potentially compatible? Like, to what degree is inflation singled out by being compatible? Uh, I think that's more controversial right now. I think that, so EOS and Steinhardt and Loeb, well, EOS and Steinhardt push a different view, which has a sort of bouncing universe structure. So rather than having a singularity, you have a bounce. Um, I don't think that, so there's various people working on that. I don't, it's, uh, 
I don't have a good sense of the sort of current state of play. I think there's uh, a lot of people who are quite skeptical of that proposal and whether it actually works out. Um, within, uh, within string, so uh, for example, Robert Brandenberger has explored various uh, alternatives that are motivated by string theory, like string gas morphology. There are a variety of alternative theories that have been proposed that are, as far as I know, equally compatible with the evidence for inflation, but I don't know that even their advocates would say they're equally good theories in the sense that inflation is actually fairly well understood in terms of how the theory works, and I think some of these others are much more provisional um, and haven't been worked on uh, you know, for the decades that inflation has. So I, I think inflation is still the dominant way of thinking, it's still sort of the dominant paradigm, certainly. Um, but as I said, I don't think from a sort of epistemic point of view, it's as tightly tested as other cases in the history of physics. Over here? Yeah, so with the multiverse theory, are these thought, thought of as like physically separate uh, bounded universes, or are they thought of as like unbounded universes that like someone can interact in the same like fabric in space time? It's really more of the former, although they're not completely disconnected. So, but the idea is that once they've separated, they're no longer interacting. But it is important that they uh, do form part of the same overall space-time. So one thing that people have tried, for example, is to say, well, if you had two bubbles collide in the very early, so if you had two bubbles that ran into each other as they were forming, would that leave an imprint that we could then see in the background region? So people have done calculations to try to, to show them what you'd see is sort of a ring of uh, a, a sort of temperature that's a different value in a ring. Nobody's seen that, but that's a way of trying to see effects of bubble collision. So they're, they're are, they are part of the same overall space-time. Then we have one in the back, yes? Yeah, um, it's a cosmology talk that you mm -hmm. have to ask you, is anything to say on dark matter or dark energy? Oh, well, dark matter and dark energy are very, uh, very interesting questions. So I think, the, <clears throat> I think the case in favor of uh, dark matter and dark energy is very different. I think both of them have evidence in their favor. The, the thing that's distinct about dark energy is that the case for dark energy really depends on cosmological assumptions. So dark energy really shows up in its effect on the overall expansion of the universe. And in order to, so, so think about it this way, if you want to see the effects of dark energy, you see those effects in terms of how things are moving at very large scales. So you see that the supernova are moving in a way that's different than you expected. That's at a very large scale. Um, and so you need, in order to draw conclusions based on that, you need to have a cosmological model in place to describe how those supernova are moving and then what they reveal about what energy and matter is present. Dark matter, on the other hand, there's evidence for it on the scale of galaxies. Galaxies are tiny compared to the cosmological scales we're talking about. Right? So dark matter, the kind of evidence for, that you have for dark matter is very different. And actually, there's also cosmological evidence for dark matter, but there's evidence that depends very weakly on the cosmological